We're also joined by our chair, Bill Best, so I'm glad to see him. And before we get into any other business, I do want to recognize uh, Dr. Garudi for his uh, gift of the Victory Statue. Ron, thank you for that. I think it fits with our theme today, among the things that we'll talk about, and, and really thank you for that, for that generosity. Um, I'd like to ask the uh, secretary if she would uh, reveal the call of the Good afternoon. Before we begin, I'd like to welcome members of the public to this open meeting, but also request that our audience respect the meeting space of the Board of Trustees and remain in the audience section so that the university is able to efficiently conduct its business and ensure other members of the public can hear the proceedings. Pursuant to Public Law 1975, Chapter 231, the Open Public Meetings Act, public notice of this meeting was filed on June 13, 2018, with the Office of the Secretary of the State of New Jersey and three newspapers, the Cherry Hill Carrier Post, the New Brunswick Home News Tribune, and the New York Star Ledger. Public notice of the meeting was posted in the following university libraries, the Alexander Library in New Brunswick, the Dana Library in Newark, and the Robeson Library in Camden. In addition, notice of this meeting has been posted on the Rutgers website under governing boards. You've all seen the meeting agenda and materials. Does, any, does anyone have a conflict of interest to in, um, disclose at this time? Madam Secretary, I'll recuse myself for the bond issue due to my employment. Thank you, Mr. Okay. I'm going to check. I'm now going to check the roll on the phone. Do we have Mike Duhain? Yes, I'm here. Welcome. Jennifer Lewis Hall. Yes, good afternoon. Bob Mortensen? Yes, good afternoon. Tulu Oyukunde? Pat Nasigal? Ken Schmidt? I am here. Bob Stevenson? Yes, I am here. Can I ask who just came on the call? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Okay. Is there anyone else who I did not call this on the call? Ron Wilson. Hi, Ron Wilson. Anybody else? Okay, I'm just going to remind everyone to please mute your phones until it is time for you to speak um, to help with the background noise. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call your attention to the meeting minutes uh, that were posted to the portal and ask if there's any additions or corrections. If not, uh, I would ask for a motion. So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? No. Thank you. Any discussion? If not, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you. Uh, next, I'm going to call on Mr. Tolasto to present a memorial resolution and also ask Dr. Doherty to assume the chair. Thank you, Madam Chair. Let it be recorded in deepest sorrow that Felix and Beck a loyal son of Rutgers and longtime member of the Board of Trustees, died on March 26, 2019, at the age of 93. Felix first graduated from the university in 1949 with a Bachelor of Science degree <coughs> at the School of Business in Newark. He later received an MBA degree in 1953 <coughs> from the Graduate School of Management, which named him alumnus of the year of 1986. Throughout all the years his affiliation, with his affiliation with Rutgers, Felix gave a lifetime of work for the benefit of his alma mater, clearly demonstrating an abiding commitment to uphold the highest values in the advancement of higher education. It was a sterling example of philanthropy and volunteerism. <clears throat> Felix was a committed trustee from 1977 to 1994, providing advice to his work on nearly every committee throughout those years as well as during his six terms as vice chair of the board. In recognition of his many years of exemplary service, he was named a trustee emeritus in 1996. 
Felix also served as a member of the Board of Governors from 1991 to 96 and was an active member of the Board of Overseers of Rutgers University Foundation, receiving lifetime member emeritus status in 2004. Having led numerous financial and mortgage companies, most notably as Chairman Emeritus and consultant to Chase Home Mortgage, Phyllis gave freely of his vast knowledge of financial matters and was instrumental in the mid-90s when he cheered the campaign to build a new Rutgers Stadium. The deck presidential suite adjacent to the stadium was named in his honor with his wife Doris for their support of Rutgers Athletics. In 1998, Rutgers University Alumni Association inducted Felix into the Rutgers Hall of Distinguished Alumni, which as you know is the highest honor bestowed upon alumni. And in 2001, he was honored with the Alumni Meritorious Service Award. Dear resolve, therefore, that as an expression of the board's grateful remembrance of Felix Beck, his dedication and service to Rutgers, the State University of New Jersey, this memorial resolution shall be recorded in the minutes of the Board of Trustees, and a copy shall be sent to his family, yep. along with our heartfelt and deepest condolences. Board of Trustees, Rutgers University, June 19, 2019. Madam Chair, if you will, I wanted to just take a few minutes to uh, share a few recollections with Felix. <clears throat> I first met him when I was the newest member of the Board of Trustees, and he was one of the senior members. <clears throat> And what stands out in my mind is how willing he was to share his insights, his knowledge, especially with those members of the Board of Trustees who really didn't know much about what the responsibilities were in those days. He was truly a gentleman's gentleman. In the business world, he was somewhat of a visionary. He only started out with the Margaret Insurance Agency in Perth, Amboy, New Jersey, back in the 50s. <clears throat> And as time wore on, some of you may not know this, but when you apply for a mortgage in the 50s, 60s, or 70s, there's only one type of mortgage you could get. That was a fixed rate mortgage. Felix invented the adjustable rate mortgage. It was Felix who basically started the adjustable rate mortgage, which today is one of the mainstays of borrowing to buy a house or a home. Second story I remember is that <clears throat> Felix and his wife Doris were very dedicated and, and really <clears throat> were inseparable, always together, at Rutgers events and also political events. Doris, his wife, was mayor of South Orange for about 20 years. So she would drag him to a number of political events. And I remember one of the events, Felix had met someone. And the person asked Billy Felix what he did for a living. And he said he was the chauffeur for the mayor of South Park. <laughs> the last story has to do with Felix's son. Felix and Doris had two sons, I believe. And one of the sons decided that he wanted to embark on a career of sports, or sports broadcasting and wanted to be a color, color commentator for sports events. And Felix wasn't too sure that that was kind of a lucrative feel for him to get into. He was very competitive. But his son went on to not only capture a position in that field, but he actually got a job as a color commentator with ESPN. His name is Bruce Beck. Some of you may have seen him. And one of the happiest moments in Felix and Doris's life was when Bruce was, became the color commentator for Rutgers University football and basketball games. Thank you, Madam Chair.
but in these two short years, I've appreciated her leadership, thoughtfulness, and wisdom. We've had many discussions while she has been traveling on New Jersey Transit, going to and from New York, Philly, home, Rutgers, and I've even heard her get shushed in the quiet car. <laughs> Sorry, Mary. Mary's always had time for me, and I know she's always found time to talk with any of you if you've had an issue or problem that you wanted to discuss. These are just some of the qualities that we need to share, and I'm humbled that I'm following her. Mary, I'll miss working with you, but I'll always know that if I need you, you'll be there, as I will be there for you. Now, whereas Rutgers the State University of New Jersey has benefited from your selfless service on the Board of Trustees since 2013, when you were inducted as a Charter Trustee, and whereas in fulfilling the trustee's advisory role, your financial acumen, thoughtful guidance, and unwavering integrity proved invaluable to the Board of Governors Committee on Audit, and whereas as Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees in 2016, 2017, and 2017, 2018, you assumed the reins of the trustees' philanthropy efforts and propelled those efforts forward, achieving 100% board member giving each year and increasing giving to student need-based financial aid through the Rutgers Assistant Grants. <clears throat> and whereas the board again looked to your wise counsel when it elected you chair of the Board of Trustees, entrusting you to shepherd the implementation of the recommendations in the report of the task force on student aid, and you answered the call with a dynamic vision to change the culture of the board and establish the task force on philanthropy and the task force on legislative engagement. And whereas communication, understanding, and judicious reasoning combined with an acute understanding of the role of the Board of Trustees have been the hallmarks of your tenure as chair as you made every effort to listen to members but to also communicate with them individually and collectively between meetings. And whereas your term as Charter Trustee and Chair of the Board of Trustees will come to a close on June 30th, 2019. Now therefore be it resolved that the Board of Trustees of Rutgers the State University of New Jersey warmly and appreciatively thanks Mary I. D. Martino for her service to the Board. And be it further resolved that Mary I. D. Martino will continue to enjoy our highest esteem and that her colleagues look forward to reaping the benefits of her experience and inspiration as she continues to serve her alma mater as a member of the Board of Governors. Board of Trustees, Rutgers of State University. May I have a motion? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? And all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? And the motion carries. Thank you, Mayor. Integration. 
uh, but we hadn't had a strategic plan done for the university for a considerable period of time. Well, not clear how many years, but it was decades. Um, so we set about a university-wide exercise, brought in uh, groups from around the university, talked to university-wide fora uh, to develop a strategic plan uh, for the overall university. Uh, and in this, remember, we're talking about a plan that was actionable, not one that's going to sit on the shelf, one that we could look at as more of a tactical plan and uh, <coughs> execute within a period of five years. That's what we said we're going to do. Well, it's been five years. And it's time for a look back and see how we did it. I just want to remind you that at the same time, uh, immediately after we finished this strategic plan, the chancellors led strategic planning exercises on their own units because for each of our chancellor-led units, uh, there were um, specific visions for where they were going to go, what they wanted to accomplish that didn't necessarily fit in, that no, they fit into it, but didn't necessarily um, uh, have a, 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 a explicit place in the overall plan. So you have been hearing from the chancellors about their strategic plans and updates to them when you go to the campuses uh, in Camden and Newark or in RBHS. So I'm going to focus just on the overall university strategic plan. If you happen to have a copy, you can actually follow through it because I'm going to be ticking off the things that we said we were going to do and asking you whether we actually accomplished them. So let's see, how do we get this result? Well? First of all, you remember that we had an aspiration for Rutgers to be broadly recognized as among the nation's leading public universities. Not to become it, we thought we already were, but to be recognized as being there. And that meant being preeminent in research, teaching, and service to the community, so that all of those had to be part of where we were going. So we set up four columns of strategic priorities, building the faculty excellence, transforming the student experience, enhancing our public prominence, and envisioning tomorrow's university. And we organized our goals under those columns. Those are the things that we thought were going to drive the university upwards. And then we also recognized there were foundational elements that had to be maintained or strengthened or broadened across the university if we were going to succeed. And those are the things that we call the foundational elements. So I'm going to want to address those two groups of items that are in the plan uh, and see how we did compare it to them. Uh, we also talked about integrating academic themes. These were courses and uh, centers and programs that we wanted to put in place uh, that would sort of knit the concepts together. I'm not going to talk about those today because there's just too many and too much to talk about there. Um, and there are more uh, uh, academic course here, of course, there. So I'll come back to talk about that at some other time. I'm going to focus on the two big areas in the center. So let me take a, a, a step at a time here. Let's start out with building faculty excellence. Uh, we recognize that we can't be an outstanding university without, a, without an outstanding faculty and it was our job to continue down that path. In the last five years, we've hired over 1,500 new full-time faculty. 1,500. Uh, and the number per year has been going up. Um, more importantly, we hired those faculty in the areas that we identified in the strategic plan as being the ones that we wanted to emphasize as we grew the university. So if you crosswalk between where that spider diagram was in the strategic plan the areas that we weren't hitting at our weight, that we needed to improve, those are the areas that we've been recruiting to. Uh, but we also recognize the need to maintain our strength in the humanities. Uh, and we committed money to do that. And a significant chunk of our hires have been done in response to that need to maintain the strength in the humanities. But it's more than just bringing new faculty um, in general to Rutgers. It's bringing the very best and brightest to Rutgers and making sure those who are already here who are the best and brightest are recognized. The first thing we saw that we needed to do was increase the number of endowed chairs because endowed chairs are the currency of the realm in academia. We were by far the lowest in the AAU and far away the Big Ten in the total number of endowed chairs. We focused on that. We were able to double, more than double, our endowed professorships in the last five years from 41 to 89. And in addition, I established another 30 uh, Henry Rutgers professorships funded from the President's strategic funds 
that function in exactly the same way, allowing us to bring to Rutgers about 70 new faculty who are at the very top of their game, very top of their game. And uh, in that group also to retain some of our current faculty who we were in danger of losing because they were being coached by other universities. Um, we also wanted to promote the internationally distinguished faculty that we have and to recruit internationally distinguished faculty in this process. And looking back to 2012 until now, we've increased the number of National Academy members um, from 34 to 54 on our faculty uh, over that period of time. Um, some of those were people we had that needed to be promoted and, and uh, whose memberships needed to be pushed. Many of them were recruited here to Rutgers to join what we were doing because they were excited about the opportunities. They saw things changing, they saw things happening, they wanted to be part of it. Um, we also uh, were pushing our faculty in terms of their own recognition. The list on the right is just a partial one, but I can tell you that the first three on there are either recognized as being Nobel equivalents or are immediate precursors to a Nobel, like the last award. And I always want to point out uh, Greg Pardlow, uh, who's one of my Henry Rutgers professors, um, who has uh, won the uh, Pulitzer Prize for Poetry down in Canada. So we have a distinguished list of faculty that's growing. It's part of what makes the Rutgers reputation. It's part of what we're evaluated on when you look at us in our, our ratings. We also have made a major commitment to diversity. You know that um, four years ago, uh, I started a $22 million program uh, to uh, improve our diversity, which we thought was not really where it should be. Uh, and recently, I committed another $20 million from this presidential funds up to 24 to continue this process. It's the biggest single commitment from my presidential strategic funds. Now, what you have to understand when you think about diversity, um, you can't go out and hire diverse faculty. It's illegal. Like you can't say, well, we're just going to hire minorities. You can't do that. So you have to change the culture of how faculty are hired, about how they're recruited, about what the search committee looks like, what the pool looks like, uh, and how you take care of those faculty after they're here. The second thing is it's a slow process. If we put 100% of our recruitments in any given year that I showed you before, 100% of them were minority recruitments. It would change the percentage of minorities on our faculty by around 1%. Because we have so many faculty in return to the school. So this is a process that will take many years. But I can tell you, when I look at this and I see that New Brunswick went from 5.6 when we started this program to 6.8, and RBHS from 5.4 to 7.1, Newark already way up there, and Camden coming along, those are major changes in our diversity that you should be proud of. Took a lot of work to get that to happen. We stay on that trajectory over the next five or six years and we'll be where we want to be. Moving on to the next strategic column, the next strategic priority, transforming the student experience. Um, this is the are you screw issue that everybody talked about a lot about here. Many of you know about that. We heard about it at graduation. Um, what have we been able to do about it? Again, we had a whole bunch of initiatives. The first one was to create at Rutgers honors colleges that would help to keep the, the uh, 30,000 or so students who graduate from high school in New Jersey who leave every year to go to college elsewhere, to keep the best and brightest here and to attract some of the best and brightest from outside of Rutgers to come here. Because we know that they'll tend to stay in the state and that's what we want. But we also want them at our university. We had the, the Rutgers Honors College up and running. Um, we now have had four years. The first graduation class graduated this year. So we now have about 2,000 students on the New Brunswick campus who probably would not have been at Rutgers, certainly, or in New Jersey if we hadn't had this program up and running. Um, and in uh, Newark, with uh, Nancy Cantor's leadership, a different kind of Honors College, the Honors Living and Learning Community, um, is about to take off. Already has enrolled students, but it's about to grow exponentially. Um, bringing students in not just based on their SAT scores or their, their uh, high school grades, but on their ability to succeed in spite of challenged backgrounds. Very labor intensive. Every one of these students undergoes multiple interviews over a several day period. 
um, to fill the class. Um, the new honors and learning uh, honors living and learning community building will open this fall. Will eventually have capacity for 400 students. This has already been recognized around the country as a really novel and uh, very valuable way to go for honors colleges. So I just showed you a couple of the national uh, articles that have been written, written about it. And Nancy has been successful in um, convincing Prudential to provide her with a $10 million gift to act as an endowment for the scholarship aid uh, for this new uh, program. And that gift was just announced two weeks ago. So we're really all delighted for this. And down in Camden, uh, we have another honors program, uh, not a facility because we don't have the residential facilities there, um, but that's been in, in place for a number of years, and, and Chancellor Patton has been growing that. Other things that we said in our strategic plan, how are we going to educate these kids? And we came to the conclusion that we had a lot of great teachers, a lot of great information, but we could be moving the students around to get to every class we wanted to get to. So we talked about a transformational approach of telepresence classrooms. I've told you about this before. We have been building these at two levels. One level capable of handling 250 to 300 students in a course at a time. Another level handling 50 to 60 in a course at a time. Uh, totally immersive so that independent of where you're sitting at either location, you will see the same in, uh, instructor and the same experience you will see everybody in the other classroom. They will all see you, and you can ask your questions and interact with the, uh, with the instructor. At the top is one of the big classrooms, uh, like the one we have at Mike Lyman and over at Cook Douglas, and now down in the nursing uh, building in Camden. The bottom one shows the two halves very well of one of the smaller classrooms. You can see the two semicircles in that classroom and at the remote classroom. Everybody can see everybody else. Everybody can talk to everybody else. Um, and um, we're adding to these every year. Very high acceptance from the students and from the faculty. They're books completely. Can't get a slot in them if you want to teach them. The other thing we've been doing is to look at active learning classrooms instead of having students just sitting in a classroom and taught in a didactic way. Uh, we want students participating, engaged in the learning process. And the active learning classrooms are doing that. Um, they're just full of these large monitors. The monitors are like whiteboards. The students work in pods with computers and internet access. They can write on things that appear on the, uh, on the monitors. They can mine data, put it together, do a presentation on the monitor. It's very interactive, very collaborative. We have eight of these up and running <coughs> right now, uh, and we're adding to that um, with each year. The next thing is making it easier to be a student. And this is what we're really talking about. We've gone ahead over a three-year period and moved to a single learning management system, Canvas, uh, in place of all the other ones that we've been using at the same time across the university. This is now uh, the, uh, the common modality for the entire university. Uh, we're putting in place, uh, we have put in place, and we're running for the final shadow cycle now, we'll go active next year, um, a computerized system for course scheduling for all of our students, all of our first year students. Um, this is not just in New Brunswick, it's at all our universities. And really the primary goal here is to make sure that they have access to the courses that they need to graduate. Shorten their time to graduation. Because we have problems with students who enroll in one course and they can't get the second course they need in a series, they lose a semester because of that, sometimes a year because of that, um, and that will go into place. Additions to the bus system, particularly in York and uh, New Brunswick, again, according to the strategic plan, can ease that burden on student travel. The other thing that we've done, uh, we have promised in the strategic plan to establish uh, one-stop shops for our students. So on each campus, they can go to a location and take care of anything they needed for their finances, <clears throat> for their housing, for their course scheduling, or anything else that they needed as a student. Uh, we have been working towards that, but in the meantime, our CIO and other folks on the IT side developed this uh, online student portal, uh, which gives each student a unique access to um, a portfolio of information that you can see up there, whether it's on their computer or on their handphone or on their iPod, 
where they can do any of these things online for tight, it's really uh, specifically tailored to them. They can take care of their courses, they can pay bills, they can look at their bursary charges, they can check their financial aid, they can do any of that. Um, this has been a huge hit. It's used by over 98% of our students right now, and in, in the first 10 months of operation, we've had over 6 million hits on the system. To the point now where we're stepping back a little bit from building the, the physical one-stop shops because that will look like we're going to need them like the same way we did before. We can get it all done in this way. This is the way students do their business. This is what they want. What we do see is we don't see the lines and registration. So it is certainly working. On top of all this, we made a commitment to access and affordability. We said in the strategic plan that we would do these things, but we would respect the diversity of our students, both socioeconomically um, and ethnically. And we've been able to do that uh, even though we are a high tuition, high discount school. If you look at the students who are the most needy with family incomes below $50,000, they pay practically nothing to come to Rutgers. Right? So it's about $270, $280 for tuition and fees here in New Brunswick. And it's completely covered by their Pell Grants and other grant awards, not loans, but grants uh, and, in Newark and in Camden. But the most important thing that we were committed to and I think we have done. In 2007 to 2012, the compound uh, uh, annual growth rate for tuition was 4%, 2.95%. And between 2013, 2018, 2.3%. So we're keeping those costs down. We're doing it by running a very tight ship and a very narrow operating margin, but we have been able to do that. Now, all these students that are coming in, especially ones who may need to work, who may need to supplement their income, uh, need additional student services, whether it's financial, uh, the run to the top of the bridging the gap programs that, uh, that Nancy and Phoebe have put in place on their uh, campuses, or any of the other programs up there, leadership programs, training programs that we have added <clears throat> to make it uh, easier for our students to succeed. And the bottom line, when you look at this, in terms of whether we did what we said we were going to do, is to look at the neediest students, our Pell Grant recipient students, and say, how do they do compared to the rest of our non-Pell Grant students in graduating? It's one of the measures that are made in the Big Ten and the um, AAU. And I'm going to show you that data for the Big Ten because uh, I can't get it as easily for the peers in New Brunswick and in Canada. We have it, but it's a little more difficult to show. Um, here it is. Right? If you look at the gap between our Pell students and our non-Pell students from graduation in the Big Ten, we lead the Big Ten. And then not by a little bit. We lead it by quite a bit. All right? So there's only a 5% gap at Rutgers, whereas if you're at the University of Nebraska, it's over 15% difference in graduation rate. And this is not because we have a lower graduation rate. Graduation rate at Rutgers is in the 80s percentile for six-year graduation, which is as good as anybody out there. You know, we're a little bit below Michigan, but that's it's really right off the top um, uh, quartile of our university career. And the other thing that we're very proud of is that people now calculate the, uh, the ability of a school to graduate as students um, at a percentage higher than the predicted rate for that student body. It's measured on the basis of the student body itself. That's now a measure that's used by U.S. News and World Report for rating universities. Um, and here's where we come out. New Brunswick graduates our students 8.5% higher than predicted, where our peers are about 3.5%. York is doing it 14% higher, where its peers are minus 4%. And down in Camden, uh, with a very highly needy population, uh, they're doing about 1.7% better than predicted. So we're really hitting it on this one. Uh, this, I think, says it one of the reasons why uh, our, uh, our rankings have improved. Okay, so let's talk about rankings and problems. We, we looked at Rutgers with the strategic plan and we said, you know, we're pretty good. We're a lot better than people think we are. You know, we're not punching at our weight. So in addition to doing all these new things, we need to enhance our public promise and the things that we're, we're going to do there. First of all, of course, we had handed to us, which was the 250th anniversary. Make a big deal about it, right? Make sure everybody knows about it. Make sure that the uh, Empire State Building is lit up in Scarlet, 
people ask why. Well, it's because Rutgers is older than this country is, and we should be proud of that. Uh, that was a, a great year for us. Uh, probably the high point, of course, was graduation with 55,000 family and students and one U.S. president. Um, and as you can see up there, that's what he said. America converges here. <clears throat> the message that we've taken to heart, we publicized, it really caught the, uh, the uh, eye of the national press, and we got huge publicity out of this. We made a new shield. We thought the Rutgers shield, the Rutgers brand, the, the, the round uh, emblem, um, didn't have cachet in today's environment. Um, really didn't look right with our Ivy League peers and the best of breed in the Big Ten. So we created a new shield. Most people don't realize this is only four years old. And we all wear it, and I hope everybody's got tons of them, but when I go out and around with this, everybody figures, well, that's 250 years old, too. So I'm only out of the <laughs> We just say, sure. <laughs> we have been helping to shape the national discussion on policies that are important. We've been out there on the university in Moss talking about uh, things like uh, DACA, talking about uh, issues that have to do with women's political participation, with uh, uh, gender and ethnicity, uh, and uh, with fighting hate. Uh, major involvement with First Amendment rights and First Amendment battles. Uh, and we have been recognized as being players in these areas. So when you read the papers about these, we are commonly referred to as we did this or we're saying that or we're signing on to that. The thing I want to point out here that makes me the proudest is that when we have these demonstrations, like you see on the bottom there, with all these students turning out, we do not have violence in this campus. We do not have violence in this campus. That's because of the great work that our staff and leadership and our students do all the time to talk to each other to kick these ideas around us, because we're already so diverse that this is not novel. So we can have these discussions without having everything clear up. And everybody will just leave us alone. And what we get are these outside parties coming in and saying, oh, you should do this, oh, you should do that. Just, we got it. We got it. This is the proof. We got it. We also like to boast about our students. Um, I want to give a shout out to Art Casciato, who runs our scholarship program for these special scholarships. Uh, we're one of the top full white producers 10 years in a row. Uh, we've had 11 Gates Cambridge scholarships in 12 years. That's a record. Um, multiple gold winners, Schwartz and Truman, et cetera. But the other thing, what the students do themselves, and you know, looking back at the last couple of years, the ads we put in the New York Times, the, the letters that we've been able to send out, about our student groups who have won national or international championships, whether it's in debating or the Fed Challenge Cup or the Holt Prize or the CME Trading, uh, trading uh, uh, Challenge, um, at the national or global level. Uh, that's amazing. And then you look at the kids, and you look at those pictures, and you see the diversity of the students that we're putting out there who are winning these things. That's right. That's right. And that's the message that's going out. So getting that kind of public recognition and making people realize what we do is really important. Uh, athletics is part of that. Uh, we're now in the Big Ten in the New Brunswick Athletics Program. Uh, we'll be full equity members next year. Uh, and uh, the program has been doing well. You know, we've got a ways to go in, in football. Men's basketball, Sports Illustrated said, was the most improved program in the country this year which is saying something. Now we've got to work a few more games. But, we'll get but if you look this year at wrestling, women's soccer, men's lacrosse, field hockey, women's basketball, all ranked nationally in the, that top 20 ranking. And it's not just about New Brunswick. If you look at Newark, the women's basketball in Newark uh, were the 2019 J, J, uh, NJAC champions. Men's soccer nationally ranked in D3 and have been down in Camden, two All-Americans from the track team, and golf eight of the last 11 years of conference champions. So it's not that that many of our students play sports, but people see the students who do play sports, and it makes, uh, it makes the news. So being in the news for this is something that we have to pay attention to. And I, I must say, being in the news for 
this kind of thing for sports. <laughs> I had a whole other thing that we don't want to do. And the other thing we need to do is get the message out. <clears throat> and we need to talk about what Rutgers said. So we, um, we contracted for an economic impact statement um, that we have spread around the state to all of our legislators, to our senators and assembly people, the governor's office, um, showing that Rutgers generates about $5.2 billion in economic impact for the state every year. About $7 of return for every $1 that the state invests. And it's sort of an aha moment. People, no, oh, I didn't know that. You know, it's just Rutgers. Oh, I didn't know that. <coughs> they don't realize that Rutgers, for example, does more sponsored research than every other university in New Jersey, including Princeton, combined. As a matter of fact, my other college presidents get on my back for saying that. So you got to stop saying that, right? No. No. You better. No. I better. <laughs> Don't tell anybody. <laughs> I'm damn proud of it. That's what we do. And that's what people need to know in, in trend. Uh, we're going to talk about impact. This is the place to do it. Um, here's another area that you probably don't know about that I think is tremendously important. Um, this is what Pete McDonough and Kim Manning have been doing, um, looking at expanding our exposure. Now, in 2014, we did very little on social media. Most of your kids are on social media all the time. Maybe most of you are on social media all the time. I don't know. I don't know how to do it. They had to teach me what to do with it. In 2014, 54,000 followers. In 2018, over 600,000 followers. Right? That's faces, eyeballs on records. Right? You've got to control what they see, but that's a good thing. Here's the one that I like, positive sentiment. If you look yeah. at the media coverage, all kinds of media, our average positive sentiment was 8.2 out of 10. It was 14. I can tell you 12, it was probably 2. <laughs> when they wanted to fire everybody. Um, so I had to fire everybody but me. But we've got it. We still be two. And in 18, it's up to 9.5. And frankly, you don't get much better than 9.5 in these kinds of things. And the last one, you know from your, your drops, that those drops from peak get longer and longer and longer. Right? And these are newspaper and press and everything else articles that cite Rutgers. And it may be that a Rutgers professor did, or it, uh, Rutgers joined this, or uh, the report from Rutgers was used to do this, or the government cited this from Rutgers. From, <coughs> You can see it right there from, uh, from uh, maybe a quarter of a million in 2014 to over 600,000, almost 600,000 in 2018. So you need that. You need that visibility. You need people thinking about Rutgers when they're going to ask a question, when they're going to call somebody up for a quote. That means, A, there's somebody at Rutgers that you call, but B, they have the, uh, the uh, belief uh, that Rutgers has credibility. So when they quote somebody from Rutgers, it means something. Right? So if they quote Rutgers, they quote Harvard. Uh, and that's really important. So Pete, you guys have been doing a great job there. So what, what does all this mean? Well, it eventually trickles down to the rankings. And um, I'm not a big man on rankings, but I do like to see that between 2016 and 2018, that's two years, uh, New Brunswick moved up 14 positions in U.S. News and World Report. That's on her. And it's only uh, pushed out by Rutgers Order, which jumped 18 <coughs> places in the same time period in U.S. News and World Report. Canada is ranked 28th among all the regional institutions, and it's now moving into the R1 uh, world with this ranking. And I could go on in terms of where our rankings are, but this eventually shows up. So delivery on that, enhancing our reputation, which was a key part of our strategic plan, I think we are doing. Next is looking at tomorrow's university. How do we see tomorrow's university? What is it going to look like? How do we get there? Obviously, the biggest thing we did in the very beginning was the integration of UMD and J. Uh, most of it into Rutgers, and uh, we were really fortunate that our current chancellor in New Brunswick, Chris Malloy, was heading up that integration office and uh, really did a yeoman's job in getting this job done. Um, we are now ranked nationally between number one and number three wow. in undergraduate health professions education for the last three years. Between number one and number three, I think it's number two this year. Four years ago, we didn't have any health care education. Just
keep that in mind. We had individual schools, but we didn't have them together. They weren't marketed right. They weren't appreciated. We're now seen as one of the top in the country in this area, certainly helping our, our rankings. Um, and as we move forward, under Brian Strong's leadership, um, I'm not going to go through all this, but um, key things that have happened here have been, number one, recruitment of outstanding health sciences back in leadership positions across our VHS. Second, um, the formation of Rutgers Health, which is putting our clinical faculty into an integrated group practice model. And again, four years ago, we didn't do any clinical practice. Right. Last year, we did over 2 million patient visits in Rutgers Health. 2 million patient visits. Successful in renewing the CINJ Comprehensive Cancer Center Support <coughs> Grant and just getting a clinical and translational service award for 27 million. There are only 60 of these in the entire country. You only get one by knocking someone else off. And Brian Strong and his team were successful in doing that. So we sort of got the trifecta here now with the faculty and this program is moving forward. But of course, the next big step was building on that to form a partnership with RWJ Barnabas. Um, and as I said before, I think this is the biggest single event that we've had here at Rutgers in terms of the long-term uh, impact on the university. This is building a true academic health system with our faculty and our schools as the core. Nobody else. We own the academics in RWJ Barnabas. All our students will be trained there. Uh, we control the graduate education. We do the research um, and help to sponsor it. Obviously, a major uh, financial positive for the university as well. But uh, this was a big deal in seeing where the Mars University was going and making it happen. Um, we also have been looking at international partnerships. Now that we've got what I think is a, a new Brunswick and, and New York and Camden pieces uh, gelling, starting to reach out again in the international arena, uh, looking for ways to have a presence at the national and in, in international level without a lot of financial exposure. Um, you know that last year we got the Nearchus Foundation Award for $27 million for a program in Greece that will work on agriculture and businesses and food areas um, as one big program. And this year we signed uh, a novel and perhaps unique relationship between the entire University of Rutgers and the Republic of Botswana, the whole country. Uh, this was signed by me as president and by Eric Assisi, who's on the right there, who is the president of Botswana. Um, it's conceived during his visit with me um, last fall at a football game that thankfully went terribly. So we just have to leave it <laughs> We took everybody back to my house and we sat around in chairs and we put this program together. If we had one thing, we probably wouldn't have it. But we're often running on that and that's a very exciting uh, exercise. Okay. So now going on to the next column, less exciting uh, in terms of PR, but more important in terms of success. And that is building a foundation for the university. Um, first, of course, recruiting a strong leadership team. I think we've got one of the very best in the business. Uh, many of them are seated around the table right here um, and uh, are now in positions of, of running this university in a way that is really president independent. Um, and I, you know, I've been asked a lot, what do you consider to be success in your job? When people are interviewing me as part of these um, leadership development courses, this is one of the, the questions they would say. I think the definition of success for a president is when you can get hit by a bus and nobody knows. <laughs> and I think we were there. I mean, I can walk across campus and nobody knows who I am anyway. <laughs> This place knows how to run, knows how to execute, and we've got outstanding leaders who make it happen. Second thing we've done is to move very aggressively to a data-driven management approach. It, it, it permeates everything that we do. That's responsibility center management. That means that you run something, you get the revenue, you get the expenses, you manage it. And if you can do it well, you can keep the, the margin. If you don't do it well, we'll all see it. And you're not getting supported by somebody else. Very important step forward. Not always popular, but very important. All of my 
my senior leaders have performance-based compensation. That means not bonuses. It's not on top of their salary. It means that a significant part of their salary every year is at risk for performance to goals that we agree upon at the start of the year and assess at the end. The same thing that you all do in your businesses. Novel and at least at this institution. The dashboard metrics you see, that's the way we report to you, that's the way we measure. When I got here, we couldn't do an annual close to our budget at the end of the year. It took two or three months after July to close a budget on an annual basis. We didn't know where we were, we were guessing during the year. Now, we have the systems in place to do that every month by the 15th of the month. Just what you would expect from your businesses, we can do here. Uh, and I can go on down the list, but we have now a very strong management environment that the people who run this place buy into and now push down to their reports uh, to get more uh, uh, rigor in the system. Um, the next thing was to establish a new normal for fundraising here. Again, when I came in 2012, we were raising a little over $90 million a year. We were two-thirds of the way through a capital campaign and sorely behind the power curve to get there. Uh, and uh, we were able to, to rev up the engine, but uh, uh, Nevin is, uh, came on board during that time frame, and Nevin Kessler and his team built a new foundation um, and we're able to close that billion dollar campaign uh, by the end of 2014 uh, on target and on time. But what I really want you to look at is what happened after that. Because what typically happens after a big campaign that stressed the system is that the donations go down and then they remain flat. We took a little dip uh, for 16 and then we've been going up with record years ever since then. And the number to me that tells the tale is this. The last five years that we're looking back now for this strategic plan review, we've raised over a billion dollars in philanthropy. That exceeds all the gifts and pledges in the entire seven years of the capital campaign with the three-year reach back that was tagged onto it. So this is the new normal. This is where we are now. And now at some point in the future, you're going to have to set your sights on a new capital campaign and challenge the university to reach it. What does that mean for our endowment? Well, look at this. This is the, uh, the growth rate, the uh, CHER, for our endowment um, over the period between 13 and 18, compared to the Big Ten. We are number two in the Big Ten, right, with a 9.2% CHER. What that says is this. Our endowment hasn't grown because the market's improved. Everybody's endowment grew because the market improved. <coughs> but we moved up to number two in overall growth because we have been adding to our endowment. That's how we got from $690 million to over $1.3 billion in our endowment. We're always going to have market fluctuations, but we need to keep adding to that pot because people 10 years from now need that. It won't help me tomorrow to close a budget, but it's going to help the people who are in here 10 years from now. And that was another one of our goals for the uh, strategic plan. And of course, none of this works if you you're tearing the bottom out of your finances. But we've done this um, by maintaining very tight financial controls in the university. And the proof of that pudding is that our rating agencies have maintained us throughout this period of time, including our capital construction, um, at a um, AA3 or A-plus level, in spite of the fact that the state has gotten at least two notches of downgrade. So we are now more notches above our state than anyone else in the country. So. I mean, it's tough to say there, I can't guarantee you. If the state takes another hit, we're, we're obviously going to get downgraded. But this is a statement about how they see the, the stability of the university, the demand for our product, our financial rigor, and our ability to pull the levers if we need to, if, if problems really do get. Um, we also found early on, with some of our athletic issues and some others that came up, that we weren't doing a very good job of identifying risks. So we, we really went full bore on this. Um, we put in a program for risk management and ethics and compliance um, and uh, have that now across the entire university and every element of the university. And have a program that other schools come and look at. How do you do that? How are you getting that to work? And as I tell people all the time, you're not in the business of eliminating risk. You eliminate risk, there's no reward. It's managing risk. It's identifying where the risk may be, 
in putting mitigation plans in and plans if something goes awry, what you will do, um, and identifying people who own that plan. That is, whose throat are you going to choke if something happens? And that's what we've done through the entire university. It's really working, really working right now. But this, I think, is the key. This is the least uh, um, photogenic, but it is the most important of all the things that we've had to do. And that is, we've had to completely rip out and replace the administrative systems for the university. We had disparate systems written in software that nobody writes anymore, that didn't talk to each other. No, I kid you not. You know, you know, finance was written um, in, co we don't have any COBOL, Fortran, COBOL, or COBOL. So we couldn't patch them because nobody could write it. So. Basically, we've had to go in and change our financial management system, our procurement system, everything you see out there. When I came, we had 200 different email systems. We now have one. But that alone is a huge change in terms of the way we approach business. This hasn't been easy. This is cornerstone. This is what Mike and Michelle and everybody on the staff has been working on. Um, but it had to be done. It's like, you know, ripping a scale off is not fun, but you have to do it. And you have to get it done as quickly as you can. So we are pretty much there. Uh, as I said, we can do our closings now on a monthly basis. We know where our grants are. We have confidence in our numbers. Um, actually, Brian Strong walked in just before this meeting and told me, okay, we finally went through all the monthly numbers for this month for the, the grants awards, the grant numbers, and the new uh, submissions. And we agree. I haven't heard Brian say that since he's five years. <laughs> actually agree. We had to go in one at a time to what, 13,000 grants early in my to make sure all the numbers were corrected that we brought over from the UNDNJ. We are done. We have a system that when we say these are the numbers, these are the numbers. And the chancellors can now look at those numbers and manage with them. They can write right down to the school, the department, and the faculty member. And they know they're right. So that's a big deal. So I'm not going to spend any more time on this just to say thank you to the staff who are the management team who have done this. Hugely important. Hugely important. We still have pay, uh, human resources to go. Uh, we still have some work with student systems to go. It's not done yet. But the major efforts have already been done. And then there's a physical environment. Um, we had not built a new building around here for academics uh, in quite some time. I won't quote the numbers, but I think on the College Avenue campus I made it 30 years since the last year. Um, so we had a lot of work to do. I'm not going to go through the, uh, a complete listing, but the first thing we needed was a plan. Now, a lot of the projects came directly out of the strategic plan. So, the most everything I'm going to show you, I can show you in the strategic plan where it said we needed to do something. But we also needed a vision that went beyond that to the 15 years from the end of the five-year plan to the next 15 years. And that was the physical master plan for each of the campuses, uh, an integrated approach. Again, not something to sit on the shelf. It's something we test against every time we want to do a project. What did we say we wanted to do then? How do we want to use that space? What's the best use? Is it going in the right direction? But then on our individual campuses, uh, research and academic spaces, there's a partial list of the ones that we've done from big buildings like SAS and, and the Weeks uh, Engineering School, uh, chemistry and chemical biology still being one of my favorites. Uh, to smaller renovations and additions. Um, student spaces, uh, the uh, HLLC up in New York, uh, but also the yard and uh, Sojourner Truth Apartments and um, 15 Wash and uh, the Honors College and uh, the building over at Douglas, um, and the list could go on from there. Um, health sciences spaces just starting to take off now, uh, with ones that have been completed, a whole bunch on the agenda for the next couple of years. And community spaces, we now have alumni houses on each one of our campuses for our, for our <coughs> alumni to come back to use, to feel at home, to feel like they should be here. Overall, completed construction since 2012, about $2.6 billion. Um, and I would say we're not halfway there. Okay, so it's a long way to go, but compared to what we were doing before, and I have to say that we've been able to do this um, and tribute to Mike Gower and his team um, with a very, very careful control of our debt. 
We have about two billion dollars worth of debt, and we keep it there. We take more when we retire it, or whether we when we get better rates. Um, and the rating agencies understand that. So we've been able to get this done. We've leveraged about four hundred million dollars worth of building our future bond fund. This wasn't done with trade money. This was done with donations, and it was done with private-public partnerships, and leveraging money we can get from elsewhere, and keeping our ratings solid while we've been able to get two and a half billion dollars worth of work done. We've also been working on hardscape and landscape. Um, not as expensive, but this is what you see when you come in. You see College Avenue. Remember what College Avenue you used to look like? Yeah. Uh, it, it's not quite finished yet, but it's a lot better. Um, putting up the, the Robeson Memorial um, and things like that in our various campuses. Um, little things like the, the uh, bus stop uh, weather protectors that look good uh, are not inexpensive and the students really appreciate it. The Hawk singles on George Street and, and uh, College Avenue that tell students when they don't always listen. <laughs> but the, and, 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 and Tony and I were just discussing, we haven't had a student struck by a car in those two streets two years now. Since those singles were in. And, you know, we were like bowling for kids before that. So uh, this is a major advance. So a lot has changed. When I look at this, and I look at seven years ago when I came, uh, we had about 58,000 students. We have now 70,000. Uh, we were given about a little less than 14,000 degrees. We gave almost 19,000 this year. We had a $1.9 billion operating budget. We're over $4.3 billion now. Um, the endowment we talked about was investorships, the fundraising. Research expenditures, $470 million in 2012, almost $740 million now, and going up. Brian, you just told me you had a 25% increase in the past month. <laughs> Three quarters. In, 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 three quarters. First three quarters. For the years. Yeah. So Good we're off and running. And that's partially because of improvements, partially because Brian is making everybody aware that they're paying depends on it. Uh, <laughs> little things like that. Uh, but then the ones that go down, the, the tagger for tuition, keeping that down. Uh, construction. And the one that I still think is going to have a huge impact going forward, um, no health care visits in 2012. Over 2 million and going up this year. So, um, we've done a lot on the strategic plan. I think if you go through it, you'll see that we've hit almost everything that we said we were going to do in five years. And we, we were very clear that this was a tactical plan in five years. It was not a long-term strategic plan. Um, but we have a lot of things that we have to worry about. We still have huge budgetary pressures. We run a, a remarkably small margin for a, for a university with a $4.3, $4.4 billion dollar, uh, 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 P&L, an operating margin of 1% is, that's what we do. <laughs> You're looking at it like, whack, isn't it? We, we've run a 1% operating margin for each of the last three years. And, and we have to explain that to the rating agencies. They sit down and say, well, yeah, you're doing, but your, your operating margin is too low. I say, no. We have an agreement with our board of governors that we will keep our operating margin there. And we'll use that money to keep tuition down. That's the plan. And they get it. They get it. And they, they comment on it and they say, good, all right? Because they know if we really had to, we could raise tuition. It's not as if we're going to go bankrupt. If we really had to, we have other ways to go. We have other um, uh, alternative revenue streams that we can tap. But this is a huge challenge. Doing all this without damaging the diversity of the university, either socioeconomically or ethnically. Um, looking at how we engage your alumni. Uh, looking at the mix of in-state and out-of-state. We're still way off the mark on that. And there's lots of opportunity there uh, for us to bolster our ability to help kids in the state get a cheaper education. Um, and keeping up with our faculty and uh, the kind of quality of faculty that we want here. So there's lots and lots to do. But I think um, when I look back at the plan and had a chance to do that in the last few months, I think I'm reasonably pleased that we've delivered on the things we said we are going to do. So I'm going to stop there and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, Dr. Barchi. Um, first, congratulations to you and your team on um, a great report and a great uh, improvement and changes. And we appreciate all the hard work of everyone. Questions? Anybody have any questions? 
Yes, I just well. have a comment. This was a great report. Thank How you. are we going to disseminate it to the populace of the state and to the legislature? Yeah. This is what so, everyone needs to know. What we're going to do, um, first of all, I will give this report as my report to the Senate, which will be published. But we are actually putting together uh, a publication uh, that will be you know, a formal book that we can send out to everybody uh, that will cover all these issues, all the areas a little bit more um, you know, touchy-feely in terms of the photos. Is there any way this could be streamed, like on a Netflix or something? <laughs> <laughs> I know that there are some aspects of this that the foundation wants to put into. The problem is that you know, this took me, what, 45 minutes to do this? And what you really need to do is two minutes, right? That, yeah. and, and that part, of it, a little part of it. Thankfully, Bob, it was almost an hour, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> five years ago, and so where do we stand now, and how does it compare to other Big Ten universities? Yeah. Uh, the state support has gone down every year when you factor in inflation. Uh, but you have to understand that the state has been able to keep it flat in, in, in uh, nominal dollars at a time when their budget has gone to, you know, really gone down, right? they're in trouble. So that is a statement of support from the state. I have to say that I have not felt anything but support from the governors uh, or from the legislators since I got here. A little frosty when I first came in. <laughs> but after that first six months, we've been in a good place. So I have nothing to complain about there. We are, the, the percentage of our uh, educational budget that's supported by the state used to be um, 75, 80% back in the 90s. Now it's under 20%. Yeah. It's not coming back. So we need to look at other revenue sources to, to make ourselves more and more like a state-related university and less and less like an old-fashioned state university. Thanks, Bob. We have a uh, question. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, President Marshy, that was a wonderful um, presentation. Um, I just want to say I've recently been on a tour of the engineering building and the chemical buildings. Your efforts are definitely showing, and proof that the students are benefiting is further on the social media report. Um, I know a lot of us here are not on social media, but I just want to highlight some of the research or the feedback that I've gotten um, through my own social media. Um, recently, I've been using the work of the board, the stuff that we're talking about in meetings, um, the ones that are sort of you can publicize about, and the feedback that I've been getting from the students who are in my own age group um, is specifically showing that the more awareness that the students have about these initiatives that the board is working on, that the government are working on, that the workers' leadership is working on, they're taking pride in Rutgers University. Um, there's a common term known as like the are you screw? And the more that I'm advocating for the work that we're doing, the more it's negating that negative um, impact. So social media, I don't know about live streaming on YouTube, but in the next five to 10 years, Social media will be the easiest and most effective way we can get PR without running our budget slow. Um, another thing that really shows the power of social media is if I'm a student of the Rutgers New Brunswick School, the business school, right? If we hire a student, J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs or anybody, any company hires a student from one of our campuses and they share on their social platforms what that school or any of the founding or the surrounding campuses are doing, what that does for us is it spreads that one article to the personal and professional contacts on Instagram, Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. And these are contacts that are not just in the industry for education, they're contacts in the industry for business, for media, for finance, for politics, for everything you can possibly imagine. So if you're noticing the one point greater than one billion, um, I want to say endowment increase that we've seen, it's because people are taking note of the work that we're doing. And that is the power of social media. That's what I want to say about that front.
Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have, uh, Richard, I think, had his hand first, and then I, I think Dean. Yeah, Richard, did you, did you have your hand up? Oh, yes. Um, uh, first of all, congratulations on a magnificent report. The uh, International Food Admit is impressive, too, and Botswana is a great place to visit, by the way. I wonder what our strategy is for international, um, attracting international students, more and more of our peer institutions, including Brian, my alma mater, the University of California, Berkeley. I'm very much into that, and I know how important it is to get full tuition paying individuals. So I just wonder uh, what our strategy is for international students. And yeah, congratulations well, on a magnificent report. I, I can comment on that uh, and, and, and trying to do that in the last couple of meetings. Um, international student populations have been dropping in the last couple of years. And uh, most universities like the University of California and our Big Ten um, peers uh, have seen the same thing. Um, I can tell you that the number of international students who are um, deposited and matriculating at Rutgers this year is up 34%. 34%, which is gigantic. Now, unfortunately, they still are heavily weighted towards China. Why is that? I think two things at least. Uh, first of all, we had an uh, international meeting of um, college counselors, the people who, who counsel people about work for college at Rutgers two years ago. And I think it was eye-opening for most of those uh, individuals because a lot of the new things on, on the campuses were here. They spent uh, three or four days here, totally immersed. I spoke to them. Uh, everyone else on my team did it various times. Um, the second has been the jump in our U.S. News and World uh, 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 Report rankings. And that doesn't go unnoticed. I mean, that sort of thing happens and that many points jump up. So if the message is out there. Um, but uh, at any rate, uh, we've seen actually a, a tremendous increase. That, that worries me. It's not that big a percentage of our overall student body, but I don't want to be too dependent in terms of any one population. We need to see diversification. Um, the area, frankly, that I'm most interested in increasing is the out-of-state domestic. That's a market that we have not penetrated, that we should be right to do. And as I keep telling my colleagues, we could give a 50% scholarship on tuition to every out-of-state domestic and still make a lot of money. Um, and that's a message that just doesn't seem to get through down to the ranks, but uh, we just don't want to give scholarships to out-of-state students. Well, hello. Uh, so we're working on it. Thank you, I think that's yeah, just, just a quick comment to follow up, Bob, um, and, and the question. There's really been a very effective marketing group going over to China and India to actually, and, and a few other foreign countries that have really helped boost the comfort level of the parents of these students that are coming here, providing a lot of information. Something that's Rutgers Global under Barbara and my office has been doing. Uh, and we are ramping up the market marketing significantly to, for out-of-state students domestically to places that are so that are so far removed like Long Island and Westchester County. <laughs> <laughs> Dean and then Marissa and then Al. Hi. Uh, Bob, let me um, sure. And then I'll get to the phone uh, after I get everybody here in okay. the uh, in the room. Well, let me join in commending you on a very comprehensive report. I'm, I'm interested in a little bit more flavor on the entrepreneurial side of the university in terms of out licensing, using, leveraging our intellectual property, relationships with the business community, spin outs, and things like that. How's that trend been? Yeah, I think we're doing pretty well there. Uh, we've uh, um, started 84 companies in the last 10 years, right, Chris? Yep, 84. Um, a, uh, I think a higher than normal percentage are still alive and well. Um, our, the numbers that I look at are the number of, of licenses and patent platforms per million dollars of research expenditures, um, and we mark very well to the autumn numbers that you're familiar with. Uh, we're in the process now of working with the state to develop uh, a, uh, an entrepreneur hub here in New Brunswick. We have a commitment to 50,000 square feet of tech transfer space there uh, for taking ideas from uh, the research and getting them over the valley of death into that first round of venture funding. Um, and uh, that's moving along. So I think we do pretty well. When I look at the revenues on tech transfer, 
they run between 15 million, 20 million dollars a year. Every once in a while, they 30 million. But you know how that is. It's a, it's a hit on one patent. Yeah. Um, and the really big players out there have uh, been doing this for a long time. And they have accumulated portfolios that are still returning significant bucks. But we're doing uh, very well. Marissa Allen and then Elsie and then uh, Jean and then and then I'll go to the phone. We got a big agenda ahead, so Marissa, you want to go ahead? Uh, thank you, thank you, Dr. Marchi, for the presentation. Uh, two points. One, my question was directed to uh, Chris about international students, but I'll ask it after the meeting. The second question or the second comment was I just wanted to commend you on the strategic plan. Oftentimes reports like these are shelved, but it's really great to see that the initiatives in the plan are actually conducted and implemented, so thank you. Um, and also a comment on the enterprise risk management arm. That's really great, especially with growing concerns in cybersecurity and how it influences higher education institutions. Thank you. Thank you for your um, Just a comment. Uh, President Barsh, you had mentioned the operating margin of 1% here at Rutgers. And Edgar had mentioned, uh, I guess a question about state support. I happen to have friends whose children go to state institutions, one at the uh, University of North Carolina, one at UC Santa Barbara. And what's happening at those universities, they're actually cutting classes. So even introductory courses that you would normally take as a freshman, you're not able to get those cat classes when you're junior. And the fact that uh, Rutgers and your administration are able to do this without affecting students' uh, academic classes is, is pretty impressive. Thank you. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> um, again, yeah, thank you so much for that great presentation, um, Dr. Sarchi. I did just have a question with the, um, like enhancing the student experience. So I know you mentioned the RU Screw, um, and usually, you know, that entitles like class selection and the help with picking out those classes to make sure you meet those major requirements. Is there maybe any like initiative that we have going on that, you know, will help um, students make sure, you know, they're, they're off the right path to graduating on time? Sure. <clears throat> Actually, there are two or three things. I'll just touch on two of them. One, um, there's course planner that you can use online yourself to see exactly where you are for your major, what you need to take, um, how many years it's going to take you to do it if you stay on the path that you're on now. Um, your advisor can help you with that, but you don't even have to use the advisor. You can go on the online portal, and for you, it will show you what you need to do for your major. The second thing is the, the um, computerized course schedule is a key issue in making it possible <coughs> for us to offer the classes that students need to complete a major in a timely way. So we make sure that those courses are offered uh, not you know, at 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock, so you can't take both of them, or not at 2 o'clock and 3 o'clock, and one of them is on Cook and one of them is, on, uh, is in Bush or is in Newark or something, uh, which is the way it's working out. It's all done with pencils and papers. Um, but it is optimized to be sure to uh, allow students to make the right choices in the right sequence to get out in the shortest possible period of time. That's what it's all about. Thank you. Jean? Just very quickly, uh, for the one that uh, trustees don't know me, I'm fairly political, and I know a lot of people who are in Trenton. Uh, I could honestly say that this administration is the first one since Ed Lowstein, who actually understands uh, Trenton, works well with Trenton, <laughs> and is liked by Trenton which is what we've needed for a long time. So I want to thank, obviously, Pete, who I've known forever, and he knows that's a fact, uh, and the president and his people, because you've done a really good job. Uh, and I'm really very happy for Rutgers in the state. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Uh, anyone